I am a charismatic Christian. I have friends in the global prayer movement who love holiness and are devastated by what's happened with the Mike Bickle scandal. And so I'm not talking to bash the charismatic movement. I want to have a family conversation because this stuff needs to stop happening and it won't stop unless we learn from our mistakes. And so here are five lessons that I think the charismatic movement can learn from this whole situation. And then also one bonus point that I think will serve as an encouragement to the prayer movement. First thing is that I think the charismatic movement needs to be a lot slower to use prophetic narratives. Using a prophetic narrative means you write yourself into the story of scripture to fit maybe a certain season, uh, a certain condition that's going on maybe either personally or in society, but where it is always inappropriate to use prophetic narratives is to make an excuse for the moral failing of a Christian leader by comparing them to some kind of Old Testament figure who had moral failing and, say, and saying like, look, that person failed, God still kept them in leadership, and so we shouldn't worry about that. Almost immediately after the accusations against Mike Bickle came out, there was a prominent charismatic leader who immediately just started comparing him to King David, pointing out King David did something way worse than Mike Bickle's being accused of, we need to consider all that he's done for the body, and et cetera, et cetera. And that is just wrong. Here's the thing with David, though. David was a political leader over a nation, though there were spiritual implications to that. And God made an unconditional covenant with him that somebody would be sitting on his throne. This is not the same standard that we have for New Testament church leaders when it comes to the qualifications for leadership and what would allow a person to continue in leadership should they fall into some kind of grievous disqualifying sin. The standard for Christian leaders is not King David. It's 1 Timothy 3 and it's Titus. This brings me to the next point. Being personally forgiven by Jesus for your sins does not mean that you are qualified for New Testament church leadership. Or as my wife likes to put it, just because you have a testimony doesn't mean you should be a pastor. I bring this up specifically because in Mike Bickle's first public statement where he kind of vaguely admits to sinning but doesn't really say what he did, he talks about the fact that he thought that his sin in this area was under the blood of Jesus. And so he didn't think that he was disqualified from ministry or from leadership. Now, I'm not even going to get into questioning whether his repentance before the Lord was legitimate or not, but even if we assume that his repentance was somehow legitimate, even being like extremely sorrowful and broken over abusing young girls in the past doesn't mean that you should be in a position of leadership where you could possibly do that again. There is disqualifying sin that still warrants removal from leadership despite your personal repentance, so that you can rehabilitate the sinner uh, and give them time to reestablish trust with the body, and then also to protect those who were impacted by their sin. In some cases, you can go through a real biblical restoration process and then be restored to ministry. But we have to accept the fact that in other cases, it may not ever be possible to reestablish trust in this life. And that person would have to be content with never stepping into leadership or ministry ever again. This brings me to the third thing. Restoration to ministry isn't the primary objective. I remember somewhat recently when Todd Bentley had his second moral failing. Not even the first one. A high-profile Christian leader released a statement on an investigation confirming the legitimacy of his unrepentant sin and called him to repentance. And then he said that he believed that Todd could still be restored to leadership if correct steps were taken. What is so devastating about that is that no statement was made concerning the survivors of his abuse or the impact that his sin had on others. I mean, just imagine, how do you think his victims felt when they heard mention of his restoration before he even repented of his sin and acknowledged his streak of abuse? Bickle's situation has some similarities. What's different is that he at least acknowledges that he may never be restored to ministry. But even then, the topic of restoration is coming up and preempts any true, bare confession of sin. His confession of sin was so vague, and 
almost functioned more as a defense of his character rather than a true acknowledgement of how his sin affected his victims. That's why it's so important to note that restoration happens in an order. I think it's Jeremiah Johnson who shared this, but you are first restored to God, then you are restored to your family, then you are restored to the body of Christ and those you've hurt wherever possible. If you do all of those things and then you've been tested and you've been overseen by mature leaders, then maybe the question of restoration to ministry can be taken up. Fourth point, every sector of the church needs to get discipled on abuse dynamics, both biblically and sociologically. I don't think I need to explain the biblical case against abuse, but if you're curious, I made a few videos on that topic in this playlist. But it seems like many sectors of the church are more reticent to learn about abuse dynamics from a sociological perspective. And I understand why. Sometimes there's weird stuff there. But pursuing this from a sociological end really just means learning the consistent patterns of behavior that follow cases of abuse. We have tons of well-documented cases and research on this topic, and so we'd be foolish not to leverage the wisdom and apply it appropriately within the church. The fifth point is this. Christ is still preparing his bride, and it's evident when he cleanses his church. I know it's not fun to think of it that way because it's not very positive. It's very sobering. But exposed sin in the church is part of the process and preparation for Christ's true bride. And I know that it's devastating to see so much abuse get exposed seemingly continuously and at scale. But consider for a second that news of this type gets propagated at high levels while the ordinary labor of countless faithful people in ministry goes overlooked for decades or even lifetimes. But here's an encouraging point. The church has grown in recognizing and naming abuse so that it'll be tolerated less and less in the future. I have never seen so much good and biblical content in this subject as I have in the past 10 years. And so I truly believe that Christ is equipping his church to stand in holy fear when it comes to this issue. And so we remember that Christ came to preach a gospel for the poor and for the weak and for the abused, and for captives, and for all who choose to humble themselves and call upon the name of Jesus. We have a special opportunity to learn from this and become educated on this issue so that it's no longer t possible to tolerate this ungodliness at scale. But as for that bonus point, it's just like a final word of encouragement. I believe that the global prayer movement as a whole will not be crushed by this. Myself and others around me have been noticing that there is this growing hunger for holiness and for a real, authentic, no-hype move of God. And so in the midst of this, so many faithful laborers in the prayer movement are still breaking up the fallow ground and they're tilling the soil for harvest. Remember that the prayer movement is so much more than IHOP Casey. And there are so many smaller prayer ministries out there that are still running. And I hear about so many new prayer gatherings popping up all over churches and campuses and living rooms. And so just remember this, God still delights to work in response to the prayers of his people. Jesus still intercedes for us that we might intercede. And the spirit still prays for and through us, even when we don't have any words to utter. If you or anyone that you know is part of the global prayer movement, I just want to say thank you for your labor of love, your desire for holiness and for the return of Jesus, and just know that your labor has not been in vain.